Good afternoon. My name is Skip Conover, and I'm talking to Nancy Pfaff about her individuation as a Christian. And we've already been through two segments of this discussion. So I wonder if Nancy would bring us up to date on where we are and then where we're going today. So in our first segment, I start out with where I am today at 76, where the Divine Feminine has risen to join the Divine Masculine, and how that has changed my life. And we'll do a little more of that in our last segment. Then we went on to childhood, and how the child can actually experience the numinous at a very young age, both the dark side of God and the light side of God. We talked about encounters with the self through the encounter with love, which is the personal God. And we talked about my conversion uh, as an adult in 1971, my longing for God to desire that continual experience of God living in me, and the two of us having this ongoing conversation on a moment-to-moment -moment basis of love and guidance, and also that my journey is illustrated rather well by the mythology of the Demeter and Persephone myth, so that Persephone was in the underworld for six months, and then again in the upper world for six months, and that cycle went on and on. So we have been going through my Persephone journey as a form of individuation, and today we're up to where I am 53 years old, and we're going into more of the dying and rising cycle, which in Jung would be called more lamentation and rebirth. Okay, so we're going to begin with this slide number 19, which I'm going to share. So this quilt represents a symbol to me of a miraculous healing at the Mercy Center in Burlingame, California. I had been very, very ill with something called Epstein-Barr virus, went, which went into chronic fatigue syndrome, and I was extremely ill for nine and a half years. And in the matter of one big dream, on the, the night in May of 1995, I woke up well. And so I'm racing around the Mercy Center grounds. They were very beautiful in the summer of that year. And I picked up the colors of the grounds on that walk. I had thrown my cane on the bed and left just dashing about the grounds. It was a tremendous experience and one that really shook the psyche tremendously. A complete rearrangement of my psyche, which took a number of months and maybe even years to really adjust to but definitely an encounter with the deep self. Could you describe some of the reinterpretation of your psyche as you saw it at that time? What, what was happening? What were the changes that you were seeing? <laughs> That's very difficult to put into words. I'm sure. Uh, I did not know who I was anymore. I didn't have a sense of grounding in my previous identity, which of course was made up pretty much of an invalid identity. Uh, nine and a half years of severe illness, you can imagine that you don't think of yourself as a person with a future necessarily, right. or the possi or possibilities to do anything, barely get out of bed in the morning and drag through the day on a good day. Mm -hmm. So that tremendous shift on, you know, what has happened? Am I really healed? I feel healed. I, I'm acting healed. But I had never experienced such a dramatic encounter with God. And in that dream, God is not present in a specific image or even in a scripture. It's very much the unwinding of repressed sexuality and a regaining of the libido and the excitement and joy of life itself. Wow. So that was a tremendous shift. And so this quilt hangs in my hallway as a daily reminder that there is rebirth, that miracles are possible, 
that God is aware of everything that we're doing and thinking and caring about and loves us in the process and has the rising cycle, the rebirth cycle in mind. And so now we might go to image number 20. It's the title by the artist, Georges Roux, and he's a French artist considered the best religious artist of the 21st century. And the name of this is Resurrection. And so after that miraculous healing, I'm standing in the hallway with a number of other retreatants waiting to go into lunch, and I'm standing right next to this print of this particular image. And it just drew me dramatically because here I was healed, and yet I felt like I had just swum the English Channel and I crawled out, barely able to crawl out of the water, <laughs> and did not, you know, didn't understand what was really going on in my psyche at that time. I had not read much of Young. I had not read about encounter with the self when it comes in this kind of dramatic way. I was still feeling that aspect of myself as an invalid. I was feeling all those years of painful illness with all the many losses, loss of career, uh, loss of physical intimacy in my marriage, and many other things. So I was feeling those losses and also feeling this new energy in me, this new libido that had risen, this new life that was coming into me and just bursting into me. And so I like this particular image because whenever we have a rebirth, it seems to me from my experience, there's always this stage that Jung speaks of about the phoenix. That when the phoenix rises, there is a stage called the worm stage. And this is a readjustment to what has happened to bring about this new birth. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to share how I had to face now a number of things I did not have to face when I was ill. This new life, this new being that I was, had to face the condition of my marriage and deal with what was there. And so here I am enjoying all this new health. I'm shedding this invalid identity. And I'll tell you, it was very helpful in, the, in that period because in 1995, there was a lot, of, a lot on the news about people with AIDS. And the medicine had come out now that instead of them facing their death, they were having to face living. And that's where I was. I was having to face living. And I didn't realize it would be so difficult. You would think you'd be well and you'd be clicking your heels and off you'd go. But there's baggage from that long, long period of illness. So anyway, with this new health, I took training to become a spiritual director at the Mercy Center and later went on to the University of Creighton uh, to study further on spiritual direction and got my master's in Christian spirituality. And that happened after 1995. Right, yes. Wow, okay. Yeah, all of this happened probably starting in about 96. But I, I want to um, talk a bit about this marriage readjustment because it was a mixed blessing having that new health, uh, new possibilities, new career that took all of me, my education, my experience, and now this ability to sit with people who could share what was happening in their lives and help give them some signposts and reassurance. Mm -hmm. So how could I, as I began to consider my marriage, the biggest thing that was a great difficulty to me was my husband's feeling that he was finished with our sexual life. I'm only 53 at that time, and I was not finished. So we worked on that in counseling for about five years. And everything that was said in counseling was beautiful and on target, but there was no follow-through. And so I began to feel, how can I love 
fully in this marriage and at the same time fully acknowledge my sexuality in a marriage without physical intimacy. And I began to talk to some of the Mercy Sisters. I ran into nuns at Creighton University who were studying, and I interviewed them. And I tried to get an understanding of how one lives a chaste life in fullness, not repressing the sexuality, but sublimating it. And I'd like to just read what Young says about that. Okay. He says, sublimation is part of the royal art where the true gold is made. It's for an alchemical transformation for which fire and the prima materia are needed. And it's a great mystery. So I was taking on something. I really didn't realize the depths and the struggle that would be involved. But it put me right there and then in a very heated crucible for the alchemical transformation. Could you just tell us what the citation was for the Young quote, if you uh, have it? Yes, that's Carl Young Letters, edited by G. Adler and A. Yaffe, Volume 1, 171. Okay, so it's page 171. You know, I'm not sure about that. Uh, that was the reference that was given, was volume 1, comma, okay. 171. So whether that's a paragraph or a page, I'm not sure. In letters, normally I would refer to the letter itself, letter, you know, of a date, but you probably never saw that. No. Um, okay. I'm sure some viewers are going to want to understand what sublimation means in this case since you raised well I, I think i'll be going into that with the next slide okay all right so let me move to that next slide so this is mary queen of heaven and i was in an icon workshop where i was helped to create this and now my grandniece has her first communion gift but for me, I began to think of taking on the vows of a nun and channeling that sexual energy into loving on a larger scale, loving the world, loving friends and family at a deeper level and a broader level, and generally loving the world through prayer, through intercession, both individuals and people groups. And also to celebrate my sensuality with gardening and music and art and to accept the fact that I was choosing to put that energy into this loving on a deeper and more, a broader scale. So what I decided to do eventually after getting all my information together was to talk with my pastor who was a Methodist pastor at the time and he was studying spiritual formation, so he was willing to go along with this and help support this, I arranged for a, t a ceremony of taking the religious vows. And I'd like to read those now. Sure. So I had, first of all, I, I guess I can set the setting here for this ceremony because I had my dearest and closest friends who understood me and understood this. I had one of the sisters from the Carmelite Monastery here. I had two of my very closest friends and, of course, my pastor. We had a makeshift altar because we were using offices in the Girl Scout building until our, we had church facilities. And on the altar, there were pictures of Thomas Merton, a, a dove. There were candles that were lit, and one in particular was a candle with a scent of myrrh sent from a nun friend back in Chicago. And I had bought myself a religious costume that was a white robe with a purple tunic. And so this was I was going into the ritual because what ritual does is it communicates to the unconscious and helps with the instincts. So the instincts that are going to be struggling and wounded 
and even bleeding around the, the sexual expression needed to have these images, these scents, these aromas, the visual, the community around me. And so that was the purpose of the ritual. Mm -hmm. And these were my vows. And this was after studying a number of books because I was not taking these as a nun. I was taking these as a married woman in a marriage where I wanted my love to accept my situation and to live in it with fullness. And so these were the vows. After considerable prayer and discernment, Nancy Pfaff will take one-year temporary vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Poverty as a total response to God's loving call to union amidst all the insecurities and limitations of our humanity. Chastity as love that is total, free, unconditional self-gift to God the Creator and to others. And obedience as a vision of oneself as neither master of one's destiny nor slave to the limitations of oneself or others. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing in my spirituality, I'm bringing in my humanity and my embodied nature in those vows. So I'm not entering those vows by cutting myself off from anything, but I'm, I'm hoping to be able to open myself up to loving in a much bigger way. Now, did you have help for creating those vows, or did you just draft them yourself? I had help. My spiritual director at the time was Don Bassan, and he gave input. My pastor gave input. The Carmelites in Reno gave me books to read. And, of course, the nuns that I interviewed told me, you know, this is going to be a very human journey. You can't make this idealistic you're going to run into some bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. And so, and of course I did, but then I put all of that together and wrote these. I see, okay. And the, the poem that I sent out to my dearest friends with this invitation to the vow ceremony. So this is a poem by Jessica Powers, who was a Carmelite and a poet. And she calls this, God is a strange lover. God is the strangest of all lovers. His ways are past explaining. He sets his heart on a soul. He says to himself, here will I rest my love. But he does not woo her with flowers or jewels or words that are set to music. No names endearing, no kindled praise his heart's direction proof his jealousy is an infinite thing he stalks the soul with sorrows he tramples the bloom he blots the sun that could make her vision dim he robs and breaks and destroys there is nothing at last but her own shame her own affliction and then he comes and there is nothing in the vast world but him and her love of him not till the great rebellions die and her will is safe in his hands forever does he open the door of light and his tenderness is fall. And then for what is seen in the soul's virgin places, for what is heard in the heart, there is no speech at all. God is a strange lover. The story of his love is most surprising. There is no proud queen in her cloth of gold. Over and over again, there is only deep in the soul a poor disheveled woman weeping. For us who have need of a picture and words, the Magdalene. Hmm. Very interesting. When the poem ends with the Magdalene, is there some definition that I'm not aware of of Magdalene. I, I mean, I know, of course, of Mary Magdalene, but I don't know what Magdalene designates as, for example, Jesus Christ. Yes, is, so th is, th this would refer to the, the period in the scriptures where 
uh, Mary Magdalene is weeping. She's gone to the tomb, and Jesus is not there. Uh -huh. And she is weeping. Mary of Magdalene, that's where she was from. I see, okay. And so, <laughs> so she is weeping at the tomb because Jesus' body was not there. And as she's weeping at the tomb, he appears to her. And so this last line, for us who have need of a picture in words, the Magdalene, a woman who loved him with all her heart, had hoped to make her goodbyes to his body, and it wasn't there. And then she, and she goes from weeping to astonishment at his risen self. And so it's, the poem is saying that those of us that follow a deep, spiritual path, if we're going to really have the ego surrender, not just a little bit, but a deep and surrender coming through great brokenness, that that is the point at which this incredible sacred marriage takes place, and there is a union of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this prefigures that for me, because I have not, I did not know exactly what that would be until just this summer in 19, let's see, 2019. Right. But I wanted to put this in there because it helps us unite the darkness of God and the lightness of God. But they're not separate, and they do have a constructive purpose. It's like a gardener who fertilizes the plant and digs around it. And there's a scripture in John that talks about the gardener who prunes even the fruitful vines so that they can be more fruitful. But there are those times in which we experience the darkness of God. We lose our perspective. And in some places, I lost my faith, which I will share later. But just to point out that the Christian viewpoint in the mystical tradition, like the Carmelite tradition, brings both the darkness and the lightness of God together okay. in shaping the soul. Can you distinguish the mystical tradition from other ways of looking at Christianity? When I became a Christian, I had a very unique and powerful experience which I have shared in our last segment. Right. But before that, I was probably what you called an everyday Christian. I read the Bible. I went to church. I prayed. And I thought that was about all there was to it. And I wanted to be a good person. And I thought that was about all there was to it. But what I learned in my conversion where I really encountered the self was that this was a whole person experience, meant to be a whole person experience that involved the fullness of the psyche. And that when the Bible speaks about sin, we're talking about the ego being in charge and in the driver's seat and the need for that to be changed. And so we're talking about the difference between one kind of Christianity and the mystical. Right. So you were talking about the everyday Christian and, yes. and how are you defining the mystical Christian? Yes. So before my uh, conversion, and this really took place in two stages, one was realizing that God knew me personally, not just in a general way, and then not long after that, I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking in tongues. And what that does is to shift the ego out of the driver's seat so that you have this contact with the deeper unconscious and you are in tune with that and you know how to respond to that. You, you are taught from an inner way. You are taught in an experiential way how to respond. So that you, you can say, you know, you can kind of look inward with a question, you know, what should I do today? And there is a sense in which God guides you, and you feel a sense of life and enthusiasm 
in different degrees that helps you know where to go. So instead of the ego deciding, well, I'm going to do the dishes and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to do this, it, there is this openness to a deeper reality. And this started my mystical journey. And I think the charismatic movement that came out of that beginning in, I'm, an, I'm identifying the beginning as 1960, when Dennis Bennett, an Episcopal priest, wrote a book called Nine O'Clock in the Morning, which is still available on Amazon, mm -hmm. where he talks about his own personal experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so that opens up to the whole psyche. And it's not just before conversion, I wanted to be a good person. So I read in Luke the various passages on feeding the poor and doing good deeds and so forth. And I began to implement those in my life. But in the mystical version, it's an actual change in your whole psychological makeup to where God is in the driver's seat and the ego is surrendered. Now, in the beginning, the ego is still a whole lot in the driver's seat. But there is a deep awareness of another center to which you have a responsibility and also a, de well, it's a delightful responsibility because at that time with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was opened up to love throughout my psyche, throughout my body, throughout my mind. It was a full body, soul, and spirit experience. And so it was a tremendous change. So it was an encounter with the self. And through that, kept me going until I found the Carmelites and the Catholic expression where I could go back to the beginnings, to the mm -hmm. Desert Fathers that had some writings in 300, or then work up now. So, so I've worked up now to where when I had this experience this summer, this brokenness this summer, and then the rising of the Divine Feminine and the uniting of the Divine Masculine and Feminine. There is the sacred marriage that one hopes to reach in full individuation. But there's a process of that ego being true to a deeper center over a long period of time. So, Nancy, one thing I have to ask here, because I'm not very experienced in the evangelical style of Christianity. I've had a couple of experiences, but, but nothing where anybody really educated me. Within that sort of approach, within that Christian uh, mystical approach, would you say that Christians that are in, and I don't even know how to describe it because there's various definitions of evangelical Christians or various other types of Christians in the United States, but like fundamentalists and so on. Would you say that those traditions, fundamentalist or, or evangelical, and maybe you distinguish that between those two, I don't know. Would you say that there is consciousness that you're dealing with the psyche and not with some supernatural being? That would be hard to say because it would be an intuition on the part of those who look to the Bible as literally true. The fundamentalists are very much that way. The evangelicals are a little different, and I'm speaking generally, mm -hmm. uh, in that they allow for the Bible to have historical passages that may not be applicable in our own day and age and also aspects of the scriptures that are allegorical rather than literal. So the evangelical, many evangelicals have that understanding that opens things up a little bit more. Now, in the charismatic movement that I was in, it was a combination of the evangelical with this new experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit which today I see as an opening to the deeper levels of the psyche, allowing that 
deeper self, but center, the deeper center of the self to have input into the everyday life. But the charismatic movement also was very Bible-oriented and very much taking the Bible literally, but with the evangelical openness to history and to allegory. I need to still clarify. Within those movements, whichever they are, do you think that the believers in those movements look to a Geppetto-style puppet master in the sky, like a supernatural god. And well, it's still hard to answer that because those who believe the Bible literally, if they come to it and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them through those words, in other words, to enliven the written word and make it personal to them, then there is life, and they're experiencing life God within them. I don't think they would be able to put it into those words, but it would depend on the person whether they are really opening to the written word of God in a way that that word impacts their life and they change their behavior and attitude. So if that written word is actually uh, part of the process of development, the different stages of development, then they would be experiencing God within, just not being able to say that. But it would be very difficult to talk to a fundamentalist in this way and get at that particular truth. Or a charismatic or an evangelical, all of these would not think in terms of God out there and God in here. It would be much more there would be a sense of God as a generality that would be out there, and they would not verbalize God in here, but they could be experiencing God in here through the interchange with the written word of God, making an impact on them and their lives. Right. I can certainly see that and understand the significance of that. and. Obviously, one of the big issues going on in the dark web right now is this issue of whether the scientific method has done away with the supernatural God. I mean, there are a lot of debates on that and so on. And so I'm just trying to understand where people are coming from in terms of that sort of discussion and also how how does someone who is a, a young person and this is because a lot of the viewers of this channel are young men between the ages of 18 and 35 if you were a young person who hasn't really been brought up in the church what is it that gets them to start I understand that once you get into study within a denomination, that gradually the words of the Bible will have numinous impact on you. All right. So I, I do accept that that happens. But for example, Bishop Barron is this Roman Catholic bishop on the West Coast who's in charge for bringing people into the church he's asked how he does it or how he can do better in his task. And he says, we have to teach the catechism better. But I'm, I acknowledge that once you teach the catechism or whatever the dogma is of any given religion, that it will have an effect and it will activate these various religious functions within the human psyche. But how would you tell Bishop Barron what to do to get people to listen to the catechism in the first place? That is an amazingly difficult question. Let me shift back to just my own experience a little bit that might be illustra illustrative here. Because when I was, before my conversion, I was a person very much who had studied psychology, I had studied physics, 
I had studied mathematics. And so I brought the scientific view into my Christianity. Now, I did not know any better how to integrate that into the Christianity that I came into in conversion, which was an evangelical style, almost fundamentalist in style. But because I had had an experience of God, an experience of love, that so overshadowed the scientific view and my education and so forth, that it drew me forward in trying to develop that intimacy. But as I went along, what I had to do was to, and I don't know that one can do this until one reaches the level of maturity where one can hold paradox in their, in their consciousness. But I came to a place where I could hold the Jungian psychology and also the numinous of the stories in the scripture and let them both speak to me in equal power. And I did that through embracing the child within me, the child consciousness within me. Which is the divine child, which is the divine child which Dr. Jung spoke of. And so I could read a passage of scripture. I would first read it from the child's perspective to allow the numinosity to come through. And that would be very much like active imagination or taking this taking the story as a dream and working with it in the Jungian style with dream work. Mm -hmm. And Robert A. Johnson has a wonderful book called Inner Work that would help anyone get right into that. So coming to the Bible as a modern young man or young woman with the scientific viewpoint, worldview, one can go to young psychological scientific viewpoint and come to the Bible as dream and process that as dream. I've spoken in our previous segment about the spiritual discipline of Lectio Divina, where you come to the written word and expose yourself openly and wait and see what emerges and how it speaks to you in the present moment. Why is that drawing you today? What would God be trying to say to you? So I think if they were to come to, let's say, the scripture with that attitude, not necessarily of trying to understand what it means, but what does it have to say to me today? What does the deeper center trying to communicate to me so that I may be more individuated? And also, if they go into a church setting and it, it would feel they haven't been, it's going to feel very foreign. And, and possibly even uncomfortable unless they go to some of these non-denominational churches with a lot of singing and praise songs and dancing and aliveness. I can't think of the pastor back in New York that's very popular right now. But if they were to sit in that church and not try to figure out what's going on and when do I stand and when do I sit and do I kneel and I don't know the responses and what page are we on and all this. If instead they just relaxed, were present, and paid attention to what's happening within them, in their inner space, is there any kind of image that seems to catch your attention? Is there anything uh, that's being said or sung? or the exchange of the peace, or greeting one another. Where are you having the most uh, emotional or response? And St. Ignatius of Loyola calls, calls these inner movements, movements for discernment. A movement that draws you would be a movement towards life, and a movement that shuts you down would be a movement towards darkness. And in learning to pay attention to these inner movements, the deeper center is moving us in individuation. So it would be a matter of, you know, can the person be childlike enough to allow just the impact of the story to hit them and make them uh, feel something deeply? Or would it be easier to just learn how to experience inner movement? 
my work as a spiritual director is especially in helping people notice these inner movements and helping them dig out for themselves. I don't give them the answer, but I help them find their own answer as to what the invitation of God is for their life today. Right. And interestingly, part of the reason we're having this conversation is I ended up having to find my own answer without the help of the Christian church or Buddhism or whatever I may have been exposed to. And I did do it through Dr. Jung's work. Um, but there's a, in, in the context of this so-called meaning crisis, which we currently are talking about in the so-called dark web, there's one philosophy professor up at the University of Toronto named John Verbeke. And one of the things that he is saying is that we're not going to go back to those old-time old religions. And my reaction to that is, actually, that's what we should do, because those religions, whatever they are, and I mean all of the major religions, whatever they are, they are naturally evolved processes for dealing with this same thing that you're describing. And as Dr. Young's point was that you're better off staying a Christian in Western Europe rather than trying to become a Buddhist or a Hindu because the whole history of your culture, so everything that's in you from the beginning comes through that tradition. And it's not that you can't adopt certain aspects of the others, and I think that maybe we should do that, but you're going to be more comfortable with it in one of the traditions in the West. And the point is that, okay, everything about our body is evolved. Well, I'll posit that statement. And so that includes the God image and the self. And when you cut off your arm, which is basically what happens when you're, when you turn away from religion, what we, what has happened in the West since the time of Nietzsche, where all of a sudden it became conscious that we moved into this fourth stage of consciousness that the Jungians talk about, where suddenly the traditions don't seem true anymore. And so people turn their back on them largely in the 20th century. And then if you think, I mean, Dr. Bervecki's idea is that you can create a Wikipedia page and just put this practice from this religion and this practice from that religion, et cetera, into a, a pot and come up with a new religion. My analogy for that is like putting an artificial arm on your on your amputated arm, your amputated stump. It will work in just, just as well as that. Right. Well, let me say, I taught religious studies at the University of Nevada for a short period of time, so I had to be acquainted with many of the religions, and I have adopted many of their much of their philosophy and their practices in some cases to enrich my Christianity. What Jung meant by suggesting that being a Christian or choosing the Christian path, if you're in Western civilization, why that would be easier, is that the symbols are already embedded in the unconscious. Right. So as you move forward, you've already got the numinous within you in these Christian ideas and symbols. Now the problem is today that the church and the leaders of the church insist on certain dogmatic statements, principles. You've even shared a church who insists that they sign, that they agree with the dogma and the doctrine of a particular church or they can't be a member. So the church muddies things up and so we're in, a, we're in a challenge. I love the church, but it does have a way of muddying things up. 
And so we're in a day-to-day where someone who really wants to go deep, wants to individuate, wants to find the deep meaning of their life, they've got to be a pioneer. They've got to be an undercover cop. They've got to be a spy in a way and learn how to notice their inner movements, which are coming from the deeper self, guiding them to become who they were born to be and to do what they were born to do. And that's the longing of their heart, is that. And And that's the meaning. That's the meaning that people are looking for. That's it. But they can do it, and especially by learning the inner movements, daring to believe that God is speaking to them that the deep self is speaking to them because the deep self, the personal God of love that I've been sharing about my life, wants to facilitate that process in them in every conceivable way, is speaking a thousand or more times a day through everything they encounter to help them. And so part of this journey is noticing and daring to believe that God is contacting you in particular to help you choose the path of life and meaning for you. Precisely. Now, it takes a long time of attempting that, and that's what I was doing in the years following the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was noticing these inner movements and trying to respond to them. But I will say that what, ha- what is unique, ab- not, not unique, but rare about my journey is that I would have these moments of crisis in which I would lose that image of God that I had formed. And when, I, when that image of God shattered, so the first image of God to shatter was when I had my conversion experience and met a personal God who filled me with love, and I knew this all-encompassing, embracing love throughout myself. So that was a shattering of my God image that was this God who was this more of a Santa Claus than than someone that, that was not only interested in my becoming a full myself, like me, a full Nancy. I was Nancy Lee Watson in those days. uh, And then Nancy Self, Nancy Fav. But it's to become who I was born to be and to do what I was born to do, to make the contribution of my life in this world at this time of my life. And so the energy of the self, the personal God of love, wants that for each of us and is doing that for each of us, but sometimes it's too painful or too scary or too demanding if we really face our self and say, I've got to change. Right. Now, one of the problems, and I've seen lots of people who wanted to change and needed to change, but one of the problems that we're facing right now as a species is the so-called meaning crisis. And John Verveke, who's a philosopher, and mind you, philosophers are people who are working out the rational approach to life as a philosopher, has now made, as of this week, I think, 36 videos on waking from the meaning crisis. And I've seen several of these recent ones especially. Uh, The first 25 of of them apparently are primarily about uh, philosophy in general and the history of philosophy, but apparently since number 25, they've been trying to get at this issue of meaning more directly. And in these videos, Dr. Verveke is slicing and dicing things down to the nth degree. But what I observe as the problem with what he's doing is that he's trying to define meaning and in the logical sense. He's trying to help everyone create a dictionary definition, albeit a very complicated one, but a dictionary definition of what meaning is. And as opposed to meaning isn't to be defined, it's it's the purpose of your life. And that purpose is different for every individual. And so it's not a question of sitting in a classroom for 
a year and getting all the slicing and dicing that Dr. Berbeke has come up with and memorizing that and then everything's going to be hunky-dory. It doesn't work that way. Do you have a comment on that? Well, it sounds like if we're talking about the psychological functions of intuition and, and uh, sensation and thinking and feeling, he's probably, I'm guessing, I have never met the man, so this is a guess, that he probably is strong in thinking and sensation. Right. And the intuition and the feeling functions are less he's less aware of that aspect so he's coming from his own psychological type and right. he is probably speaking very powerfully to others with thinking and sensation as their primary functions but he, what he's leaving out by leaving out intuition and feeling is our human creature self and so he's he's addressing the mind but the body and the spirit are getting left behind. And so he's giving a piece, and it may be helpful for some people to begin thinking at least toward a psychological point of view, where, where that does begin to bring in a, a certain amount of humanness. But that can only go so far. That skims the surface. You're right, and this, this is the essence of what I'm saying, which is that when you have a definition in a, in a dictionary, it's because somebody who's creating the dictionary has been able to put into words some fact about the word so that it's clear what is intended. And so Dr. Verveke's natural instinct is to go for logic and rationality. But the problem is that that leaves behind our humanity and the N and F functions of our psyche. And those are the functions, and would you then agree with me that those are the functions that are addressed in church, in any religion, basically? Verveke, by slicing and dicing down to... You know, 36 lecture, let's yes. say the last 10 lectures on yeah. trying to, def he's basically trying to define a meaning of meaning so that we can be done with it, yeah. as opposed to understanding that, that meaning in the context of the meaning crisis isn't about that. It's not a definition. It's right. actually on the psyche side, on the unconscious side, on the irrational side of yes. the human being. Yes, that's right. I guess one of the things I do want to say is that this man that you're mentioning is very much in the same pathway as those who are strictly in the logos versus life. Precisely. And so... The people listening and, and getting that information and really appreciating that information will go so far, but it will not touch the deep need for meaning around who am I and what am I here for. It won't answer those questions. For that, one has to go into Jungian psychology if one is not inclined to a religious path or into a religious path, hopefully of their native land where they were raised, where they grew up. Because where we grew up and the land and the culture have become embedded in our psyche. And so out of that particular place, it's a very fertile place then for this personal growth, this personal development to take place. Right. So let's talk for a moment about the phenomenon that I've been observing and trying to talk with uh, Paul Vanderclay about for a couple of years, and we've actually done one interview on it. But I'd like to just recap that a little bit for your benefit so that we can talk about what's happened. So it began with a professor of psychology named Jordan Peterson, who 
became fairly infamous for taking a, a political position on an issue that's not relevant to this discussion, but it made him quite prominent. And so he had been doing lectures for years on psychology, and there's nothing wrong with his psychology le lectures per se. And he's written a book called Maps of Meaning, indeed, and more or less along the lines of Verveke, but trying to import some Christian ideas into it. And I actually heard of him long before his fame because a Jungian analyst who I know knew him quite well, and she happens to be a Canadian. And so she knew him fairly well and had told me I should look him up and so on. So I already knew about him then, but then he got into this political crisis that spun up his notor notoriety. And then he did 13 videos on the meaning of the Bible from a psychological point of view, basically. So he did 26 hours or more of video on the meaning of the Bible from a psychological point of view. Now, what I observed then was that Paul Vanderclay, who's a Calvinist minister, a Christian Reformed Church minister in Sacramento, got extremely fascinated by Peterson and the fact that for a variety of reasons, Dr. Peterson was attracting people back into the Christian church. And Paul had observed over months that, or years, I suppose, that Christian ministers and people like Bishop Barron were unable to attract people into the church, but that Jordan Peterson had been able. And my observation here then is that Paul Vanderclay got fascinated because he was, has been as a pastor for now 25 or 30 years, he is basically immersed in the intuitive feeling side of the psyche. And when you get presented with a big piece of sensing and thinking, side of it you do get attracted to it it's like falling in love in a sense or something right. like that yeah right and so he really got attracted to it and he and he's still almost every day putting out videos talking about jordan peterson but he hasn't understood that it, what his attraction is and at the same time we still haven't defined what's attracting people back into the church thanks to what jordan peterson has been saying, which I think relates to the fact that we've been so sold the thinking and sensing and thinking point of view that we don't look at the intuitive feeling side of the equation. And the result is that we're, we've become very logical, we've become very materialistic, et cetera, over the last century and a half, let's say and or especially, but since the beginning of the scientific method around 1500, but especially since Nietzsche said God is dead. And so that was sort of a logical decision based on the fact that the scientific method was pun punching holes in the Christian myth. What it doesn't understand is that the Christian myth isn't operating on that side of the equation. And so it's natural for Paul to be attracted to what Dr. Peterson is doing because when people become more logically aware of what church and religion means or Christianity means in the case of Dr. Peterson, there will be people who will want to go back and give churches and religions a different opportunity because they know that they're missing something, but now they're starting to see that something 
is valuable here. And so then we have a Dr. Verveke phenomenon where he's trying to he's trying to save the logic side by saying that the meaning crisis is about logic and it's not about logic. And then we have Skip and Nancy here who who know something about Dr. Jung's work and religion and we're trying to understand and talk about how the whole picture gets put together so that there's wholeness. So everybody's right, but everybody sees the value of the other position. That's right. I think it's very difficult for people with one position to uh, see the position of the other. It's like stages of faith. When I was a child, I could not imagine having the stage of faith I am in now where there is this sense of a Christ in me living as me. <laughs> you know, in my evangelical days, that would be considered, oh, what would it be? Blasphemy. <laughs> well, it would. It would be me making myself equal with God, which Jesus was accused of doing by mm -hmm. the religious people of his time. So when one moves from one stage of faith to the next, the higher stage kind of looks down their nose at the stage behind them, and that stage behind them looks at the other stage as they've lost their, they've lost their faith. They, you know, they're going astray. So there's very much tension there. But I think God, looking at it from God's point of view, if I dare say that, God's desire is for the fullness of life for all of us and is bringing us to that in every conceivable way and manner, through every conceivable message and teaching. Some are more helpful than others, but depending on the stage of faith or stage of development a person is in, they actually need a particular kind of approach. Right. And it's, in my case, what I've noticed now, I have many friends still in the charismatic movement, I consider myself to have moved away from that, although I still speak in tongues and in this new place I'm in now, where that's both a masculine feminine and a mask, I mean, a divine feminine and a divine masculine, where my image of God has been pretty much male. I have to have something beyond what I've known in order to connect with God through language. And that speaking in tongues, which is coming out of the unconscious, moving the ego off to the side is one way now that I have a, a, a great interchange of love going on that's quite satisfactory. You're speaking in tongues. I, I think it's very interesting the way you've been talking about it. I have heard uh, charismatic pastors speak in tongues, and but I never grokked and never understood at a deep level what it was that they were trying to convey by that. And I know for a lot of people who are rational and logical, they hear a pastor speaking in tongues and they say, wow, I'm out of here, man. But, <laughs> you know. But, yes, well, they're being exposed to the unconscious. Right, and, but they but they don't know that. And, that's and, right. That's okay, true. so and I didn't know that until this conversation, and mm -hmm. so it's. I think it's very significant what you're saying that when that is going on, you're getting a connection with your deep unconscious, which that's I absolutely right. agree with. I mean, based on everything I know from Dr. Young. And based on my experience with pastors speaking in tongues, I have no doubt that you're correct. And, and we have to use various techniques to hear our deep self, our God That's image. That's right. And so, you know, the Buddhists have, the, have meditation as a way to connect. And we've been talking variously in various other conversations about art and how art connects a person to uh, these things. And obviously music does that too, because, and it connects with young people in the United States, very young, where 
they're listening to music constantly. They can't turn it off. They don't know why. What I'm putting together at this moment is that music, as in, you know, country western music, you tell my life type thing, those things are actually connecting with the deep self. And so music does that, obviously. Yeah. And it's probably the main thing that does that in the U.S. besides church or besides religion. Everybody likes their music for whatever reason because it speaks to them. It has yes. meaning to them and it has meaning to their life. Yes. And all of these methods, which, you know, you explained speaking in tongues and I get it, okay, from an intuitive point of view. I get it. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what's happening. And so what I'm just trying to say here, because I think this is going to have to be a, a cut out of this interview, because we're going to have to make a, a shorter interview that addresses these issues. I do want to mention, we were talking about this miraculous healing and how that was such an upheaval for the psyche. Now, there was another shattering of my God image. God isn't exactly a being, but my image of God shattered in that, and Jungian psychology stepped in there because a dream was what was the catalyst for me to wake up well. And my spiritual director was a, got his demon degree in Jungian psychology and spiritual direction. So I had to to go into Jung deeply at that particular time. I started really seriously trying to find out and reading more. And Robert A. Johnson's more accessible to me because he's a feeling type. And the women writers were more accessible to me too than Jung's collected works. Although now I'm, now I'm starting to grok some of the collected works and the alchemy and that kind of thing, which is very powerful, very illustrative. I did want to point out that there was another shattering of the God image. And for these uh, people in their different categories of fundamentalist, evangelical, charismatic, mainline, progressive, and whatever category, in order to move into a different stage of faith, that God image has to shatter. And in most cases, people will not let it shatter. They will readjust themselves to stay within the stage of development they're in. Because for that to shatter, your whole identity is in upheaval for a period of time. And it's just too frightening. We don't have the counselors. We don't have the religious specialists in sufficient numbers to be able to help people negotiate those periods. That's right. I I think pastors, I don't know about priests, but certainly pastors and ministers I've known did not realize that they're actually in the same business as mental health professionals. I mean, when I said that to Paul Vanderclay a couple of months back, he was shocked when I said that, literally. And he, yes. he's, he's been a pastor for 25 years. But, for example, you know, when I married my first wife, we had to have a, a consultation with the Lutheran pastor that was going to marry us. And, you know, it lasted like 15 minutes. And he said, well, you know, here, here are the Ten Commandments, and this is what you're going to do. And you agree with that? Yep. Yeah okay, you can be married, okay, mm -hmm. but never really going into counseling from a psychological point of view about, yes. you know, this is what's going to happen to you in your lifetime, and you're going to have to resist these temptations and various other things, and, you know, obviously the issue of adultery is an important one, yes. and, well, we've had a half century when marriages have only survived 50% of the time, but I'm convinced that that is because people haven't been properly educated about what's going to go on in their own psyche and, and what they have 
to do to deal with it. And by the way, this is why our culture is this way. This is why we have these things in our religion, because if we don't have, then people are going to behave like animals in the Serengeti and not like cultured human beings. That's so true. I think cultural anthropology, which was a minor for me, has been left out of the school system. It really isn't taught in the undergraduate, or I mean in the elementary, junior high, high school period. And unless you choose to take cultural anthropology in college or sociology, you don't get some of this information. So right. most most everybody is not getting this information. Right. I mean, I'm, how, I'm still figuring it out, and I'm going to be 73 next month. So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. I'm still figuring it out. Right. That's so true. Where we were was slide 21. So I was talking about taking the vows right. to try to live this life fully, not repressing but sublimating my sexuality and those instincts. And the ritual was meant to engage the unconscious, to engage the instincts, to join this path, to join with me on this path. I did not know how difficult it was going to be. So for a year, I lived these vows. I lived as if the center of my love was in Christ. And out of Christ, I loved. I still loved my husband. Uh, we were still best friends. But we did not connect at a certain level. And I was expanded tremendously in the challenge because certainly my physical and emotional needs were still there. Even with sublimation, they were still there. And so I had to find outlets for them like gardening, touching the soil, touching living things, music, learning to play the recorder, uh, learning to do watercolor. Uh, I had to enter into the creative, more creative aspects to allow the instinct some expression. But at the end of that year, and my husband and I had been in counseling throughout that year, I believe on a once-a-week basis, it became pretty clear that things were not going to change. But he did say he would like them to change, and so I stepped out of that identity that I had put on into my wife identity again. But after five more years, of, four more years of counseling, Nothing had changed. And then he had a dream which, from my perspective, said it will never change. And at that point, I felt released to choose a different pathway. And also during this time, I had decided to join the Catholic Church. I had a friend who was in the Catholic Church who was what we call progressive. I'm one of the progressives in the Catholic Church, which means I'm way out of bounds for a lot of Catholics. <laughs> but I, I relate to the mystical tradition that goes way, way back. The roots go hundreds and hundreds of years back. And so it's out of that that I find my life. You can put up image number 22. I call this sacrifice. And this is a dream image that took place during that period of divorce. I had not worked for so many years because of my illness. I had no, re no financial reserves to speak of. I did have some equity in the house we were in, which I was given in the divorce settlement. But I ended up in my first living space was a remodeled two-car garage. Wow. <laughs> I was very humble. And I had been living in a re by our retreat house, which was over 5,000 square feet, on about a half an acre of land with beautiful trees and shrubs and flowers. And I was surrounded by concrete in a bare backyard. So the sacrifice was certainly in progress. Now, my spiritual director says, I was going to suffer either way. I was going to suffer if I stayed in the marriage and tried to make a marriage out of something that was very painful for me. I was going to suffer there. 
And I was going to suffer if I got a divorce. But if I got the divorce, I could be moving towards a new life, a new possibilities, and the possibility of an embodied love, which I, my heart desired. And as an INFP, that was desired in a very strong manner. Uh, so I began to taste what the sacrifice was. And this was a kind of dying again. This was a period of lamentation for me, even though, because I did not see, and of course I could not know the future. I did not know if there would ever be another man in my life. So I threw myself into starting a new career. But the losses I had to face included the loss of our family as a unit. Both my children who loved their father and who loved me felt that I was the troublemaker. <laughs> and so, so their affections turned more towards their father. So there became a gulf between my two children and myself. And at Christmas time, the first Christmas time at divorce, I could not go home. I could not go back to that retreat house. Just going into the house was was too difficult for me. So I had to find another place to have Christmas. What year was this now? This was in the year 2000. Okay. So we started in 1995 with this segment, and now we're up to 2000. Right. So I had to deal with the loss of the family unit, the loss of the retreat house with the ministry that I had there in spiritual direction and retreats. I made a huge financial descent, had to learn a completely new way of living financially. But I did gain the opportunity to find embodied love. And so we can move from sacrifice into a coming alive again. About a month to six weeks after the divorce, which is in August of 2000, I was scheduled to go on a long, silent retreat in Guelph, Canada, which is a, where there is a Jesuit retreat facility. And I think it may have been a two-week silent retreat where you don't talk to anyone except your spiritual director and then for half an hour a day, and maybe not even for that. And you are spending time being present to yourself and what comes up, and that in relationship to your Christian faith. And I had an experience while I was there at, at the Jesuit Retreat Center of being the same thing as Jesus Christ. It, it was Jesus and I were exactly the same thing. There was a subtle difference. I was not Jesus Christ, but Jesus and Christ and I were a oneness. And so out of that experience, which was, I think, a taste, an indication of the sacred marriage that would come later, but it was so significant to me that I wanted to follow that, that path and see where it led. I felt like I was being given an invitation to go deeper in working with that experience and to see how I could, I didn't even know it would be called Christ in me living as me. I know now that's what it was a taste of. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I thought it might be a good idea if I went into the Carmelites myself where their ministry is prayer. And I had an experience with Jesus in silence, where Jesus said, you are prayer to me. You are prayer. Mm. And I took that to mean that I should go into the Carmelites and become prayer in a place where their charism is prayer. Now, that was my ego interpreting <laughs> that particular message. But it came at a deep level of the psyche a deep level in the unconscious, a deep level in my spirit. And I felt confirmed in following that path. So as I'm going forward in my life, continuing to study and grow as a spiritual director, I'm also 
was given advice, wait three years after your divorce to see if that's really what you want to do because that's a radical life shift and you're an older woman. So I did wait three years, and as soon as that three years was up, boom, I put in my application for our local Carmelite monastery. And within a short period of time was told that that wasn't going to be a possibility, that my age and my health history were against me. Well, because I had, I had had this impression, this strong impression of Jesus, whom I loved, telling me I was prayer, and now there was no outlet to go to that and put some security and structure and community around that to let it grow. I was shattered. My image of God shattered at that point. So we've gone to image 23. And this is a statue in the Church of the Sacred Heart in Paris. And my daughter and I were there studying art and prayer in France. And I came around the corner and saw this statue. So Nancy, as we're talking about this image in Sacre Coeur, I want to remind people that are watching this video what we're talking about. And Sacre Coeur is this cathedral or basilica. I don't know what the difference is. Maybe you can tell us, but... This is a cathedral that is at the top of Montmartre in Paris. And when you come in from Charles de Gaulle Airport, it's one of the first things that you see. And you see it on the horizon. You actually can't see the city of Paris. But over the mountains that are between, uh, between the bus where you're coming into Paris and, the, and Paris itself, you see this rising up over the mountain. And so it's a very remarkable site and it's at the basically the highest point in Paris. Is that is that right or is that your understanding of the place? I don't really know the history as well as you may. Okay, well I don't know the history either, but I know that I've been to <laughs> I've been to Paris <laughs> numerous times and I've always been impressed by this building and I never visited it, but I've always been impressed by it dominating the skyline in Paris. And when you started to mention that you had been to Sacre Coeur, I did not make the connection. And so I think it's important to make the connection so that we know that this is, this is the basilica that you were visiting with, with your daughter. So... I, so I had the experience in Canada of being one with Christ. And right. then in 2001, my daughter and I went to France, and we're in Sacre Coeur, the Church of the Sacred Heart, and I come around the corner, and here is this statue. Those of you who may have seen pictures of Jesus, the Sacred Heart, they're generally rather sentimental. But this particular rendition of the Sacred Heart is very real. It's a very real man there, a very real man who has, is showing the scars in his hands. He's been through death, and he's known everything we have, as human beings have known, all the different sufferings, different kinds of sufferings. And he has gone beyond that, risen. And we can go beyond our lamentation into rebirth at various times in our journey. So I'm standing in front of this statue, and I have a spiritual practice of gazing, which means that I open my heart to God, and I wait for God to speak to me. And within just a, a minute or two, Jesus stepped out of that statue. He appeared to me to be the man he was after the resurrection and healed from the wounds. He was full of joy, full of life, full of vitality. And he looked into my eyes with the greatest love, a love that would encompass the universe. And in our physical age, multiple universes. And I was embraced in that love. And not only in the love for me, but it was a love that embraced each and every one of us human beings on this planet. 
And with that love was a deep compassion and admiration for us having to go through the sufferings we go through in our human life. And it has become a resource for me that I can go back to a living experience that I can re-access in memory whenever I have a need to encourage myself, remind myself that God is love, that God is with me, that God is personal. It's very powerful. You think this is a valid stopping point? Let's I do. I'm, I'm getting tired, too. I'll, be, I'll bet you are. Yeah, the next thing would be the Black Madonna is the next. That's image. right. 